This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, ex-Soviet Jews on the Sovietization of America. Backed by popular demand, Ilya Fyoktistov, the executive director of Americans for Peace and Tolerance, and Igor Milchuk, a scientist and a quote-unquote reluctant Soviet dissident. Igor and Ilya, what an honor and a pleasure to have you back on the Glazov Gang. Oh, I'm so happy, Jamie. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And, and how excited are each of you to be on the Glazov Gang, Ilya? 100% excited. <laughs> okay, Igor? 137% excited. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, we're in very scary and dark times because I am also from a country that you two are from. It seems that the Soviet virus that we escaped is coming to the West. This is what we want to discuss this evening. Before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about your guys' very, I could say, interesting backgrounds, if that's one word we can use. Ilya, why don't you tell us a little bit about your life in the Soviet Union? Well, uh, I was a child, um, born in 82, uh, and left in 92, so I lived through its sort of death throes. It was very, uh, I mean, it, it, it was, uh, it, it was a strange life. It was like the very end of Soviet ideology, so people were almost tired of it. I remember in kindergarten uh, during the 70th anniversary, 1987, I mean, people were going still through the motions of uh, celebrating, you know, 70 years of glorious communism. We still had the rallies and everything, but uh, people weren't really into it. And around that time, um, we started learning about America, about the West, uh, people like you who came earlier um, during the perestroika were able to uh, be in touch and also... Um, my father was able to come to America on a scientific exchange, and uh, that's how we ended up here. Uh, but when he first came to America in 1989 and came back, this was for a month, I remember he brought back a Sears catalog. And just looking through all that, uh, I mean, I remember just thinking America was uh, a, a land of sort of heaven. Um, I remember I took it to kindergarten uh, during nap time. All the the teachers, you know, they came to me and politely asked me if I could, if they could look at the Sears catalog. And they took it to the kitchen, and you know, spent an hour looking through it. Um, it, it was definitely a huge contrast between sort of the end of the uh, of this uh, beautiful communist. Uh, regime it was i mean it's hard to explain um yeah they, it, it, people knew they lost i mean you could see america was uh, and we all read the propaganda against america but when you start seeing the comparison between what the soviet union was in the 1980s and uh early 90s and uh what america was it was black and white Absolutely. Thank you, Ilya. And so you've set the stage for us that even the children in the Soviet Union, everybody had kind of realized that there was this death of this communist experiment, whatever you want to call it, and that obviously that what America did was something better. We would have thought that the lesson was learned. Now, we're going to go to over to Igor now. Now, Igor Milchuk, you're quite of a humble man, so I'm going to introduce you with a few sentences because you might not say it because of your humility. For our audience, you need to know that this is the Professor Emeritus of Linguistics at the University of Montreal. He's a member of the Royal Society of Canada. Now, he's a scientist and also a reluctant Soviet dissident. He left the Soviet Union in 1977 after being expelled from the Institute of Linguistics of the Academy of Sciences because he defended Andrei Sakharov in a letter published 
in the New York Times. What an honor to have this noble titan with us this evening. Igor Milchuk, take it away. Oh, you know, uh, I was born into a strange family in a sense. My father was a communist of the early hour. Uh, on the list of people who joined the famous Red Cavalry under Primakov, his name is the seat in the list. And I discovered that only years, many years, 20 years after his death, because he was hiding this little army newspaper published in 1925 with his name close to the name of Primakov and other young generals of this division. It was a death sentence. So you can imagine. But very soon after his more than loyal service and many medals and uh, other rewards, he had a, what is called uh, name, how would you say, name decorated pistol from the army with a golden plate that for bravery and things like that. But very quickly he understood in what country he lived and since there was absolutely no way out, he became extremely cynical. He lived only to protect himself and his family. And you see, when I started my school life during the war and then my semi-adult and adult life as a university student, <clears throat> I was as naive as you can imagine. I didn't know anything about what was happening beyond the walls of our apartment. It was an absolute taboo to discuss anything. So I believed completely that I lived in a nice human country and there are bad, evil capitalists all around the world trying to get me or all of us. And then the first month at the university just hit me overhead. My first class at the university, September 1st, 1950. You know what I saw? The first opening lecture for all the students of this year. We were in a huge, big amphitheater called Kommunistiskaya Auditoria. Maybe 500 people, if not more. And what we saw, one after the other, respected, revered, famous professors, whose names I knew by heart, would come on the podium take the floor and said that they were crazy and stupid and complete fool and servile slaves of capitalist surroundings. And now after the publication of Stalin's work, Marxism and questions of linguistics, do you know about this publication, Yasha? No. So uh, this was one blow. A few weeks later, there was a second terrible blow. If, again, I'm not sure that you are acquainted with the problem of what is called the Leningrad affair, where within two months or three months, a few thousand people were eliminated, shot one after the other. And one of those killed like that brutally was the father of one of my classmates. And so without any idea how such things could happen, I just became acquainted with the family and then arrests, expulsion, death, destruction. I lost my head. I cannot tell you the, all the details. It was impossible. The guy, my classmate, died of a heart attack at the age of 25. Right. And it was impossible to bury him in Moscow. I Igor Milchuk, thank you so much for sharing this. And of course, we need many hours to cover the monstrosity of the Soviet regime. Thank you for introducing to us also just, um, just even a drop in the bucket of how you became acquainted 
with the monstrosities of this evil. And so, Ilya, can you now add to this a bit, even though you were a kid and then you came to the United States to the West, but you obviously began to educate yourself and to read and to speak to many people, and you began to learn also of these monstrosities, correct? Yeah, um, so I went through a much shorter and less deadly realization from a, you know, a young communist, you know, grade school student. And I was very, I, I read a lot as a kid and pretty much everything that you read, especially children's stories in the Soviet Union where propaganda heavily laced with propaganda and some of the wonderful children's books, but I reread them as a teenager in America and you, you can tell the, the propaganda there. So I very much bought into it. Um, uh, everything they told us, you kind of don't have any other experience or any other um, frame of reference, really. Um, but, you know, when you're not seeing when they're painting the Soviet Union as a worker's paradise in these books, and then you look around you and at the shithole around you, um, you at the pollution, at the dirt, at the decrepit housing, you realize that yeah. somebody's pulling your leg. Yeah, Ilya, in terms of um, Gulag Archipelago, Varlam Shalamov's Column of Tales, perhaps Osip Maldishtam, Boris Pasternak, any one work or any one author that really had uh, an influence on your thinking as you got older? So I have a um, uh, personal connection through my grand-aunt um, with uh, Solzhenitsyn, uh, she was, uh, just like Igor, was expelled for his relationship with uh, Andrei Sakharov. Um, she was expelled for her relationship with Solzhenitsyn, um, Ella and Alexander Gorlov. Um, they actually know you, Jamie, because uh, they say you lived in Boston uh, first before oh. Canada. So, yeah, um, so, yeah uh, they, uh, th they became friendly. And what happened there was uh, my, my granduncle is an engineer. He came to Solzhenitsyn's summer house. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of, off topic, but it's an interesting story. Um, he came to Solzhenitsyn's summer house to pick up a spare part for Solzhenitsyn's car to fix it up. He was doing this. He, he was handy with his hands. And he comes there, and the KGB is growing through the dacha, the summer house. Um, so he, you know, he interrupts them. He says, what are you doing here? They grab him up, take him in the woods, beat him up. Um, Solzhenitsyn, he told Solzhenitsyn about this, and Solzhenitsyn said that this is going to be very unpleasant, but your only sort of chance here is for me to go to the Western media. Because once the Western media know about this, uh, they're going to be afraid to touch you. Otherwise, you'll just disappear. And so it came that uh, they were afraid to touch him, but they basically pushed him. And he was very reluctant, a very reluctant dissident. Um, they pushed him out, just like Igor. Okay, so Igor, let's get to how you got to the West. Tell us uh, a little bit about how you stood up for Sakharov and how this led to your, you know, the, obviously the battle with the Soviet monstrosity and how you ended up in the West. Uh, at the time when Sakharov came on the stage, I was already completely a seeing person. I opened my eyes. It took me maybe 10 years to understand, but I understood and I knew what was happening. Can you imagine? I still had illusions. I believed that if we behave in a kind of moderate, reasonable way, without irritating too much, without attacking the basis of the regime, we can at least improve a bit, just a little bit. And so I was trying to be absolutely loyal. I never violated any Soviet law. But in the history with Sakharov, what happened 
At some point in time, Sakharov, who was, uh, you know, a very curious person, scientifically curious, wanted, heard about my linguistic work and wanted to know more about this new approach to linguistic, which is formal modeling or networks in our brain that ensure the capability to speak. And through a common friend, he asked me to come and visit him in a hospital. He was after a kind of a heart crisis or something like that. He was in a hospital where you see he was rather free for everyday cares and chores and problems and could relax. And he invited me and since I heard about him, of course, I went with pleasure. And I was really charmed and became his fan. I saw the first time and saw a genius who was so humble, so even timid in his approach to problems. Well, I spent with him uh, twice. I saw him and uh, we spent maybe two hours speaking only about linguistics with some deviations to other sciences. Politics was never mentioned. After that, I was, uh, he asked me again to replace Sharansky, who was his translator and interpreter. And it was dangerous, but I could not refuse. You see, I did not even think a minute. I said yes, and I participated in few conversations with American and other uh, foreign journalists. And then one day I see in all Soviet newspapers, not in one, not in 10, in everything, several hundreds different letters condemning Sakharov who sold his soul to American imperialists. Sakharov was accused of having three apartments. So I don't know. It was impossible to see. And then the final drop was a letter from the uh, people, researchers of the academy, the whole of our Soviet academy, etc. I could not stand it, really. I felt that if I keep silent, I will simply hang myself the next day. And so I wrote the letter to the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I was writing it to uh, not to New York Times specifically. I didn't know where it will go. But it so happened that an American colleague, what at this time in Moscow, and I asked a favor from him to bring the letter out and try to publish it anywhere. Right. Well, uh, news, uh, New York Times was the first newspaper to publish it. Then many other newspapers republished it again. Well, and a week later, I was expelled from my position as somebody. It was an open uh, vote. Uh, there were about 30 people on the Scientific Council of the Institute, and there was not even one abstention. It was a unanimous vote to expel me as somebody who did not satisfy the criteria for a Soviet scholar. Thank you. Thank you, Igor, so much for your bravery and your nobility. It was not bravery. I did it. I was not even afraid, you know. Yeah. When you see something coming at you, it, you know that you have to stand it. You are not afraid at this moment, maybe later. Thank you, Igor. And, uh, and I'll just uh, tell the audience that on some previous shows Igor was on, this is why we put, you, he also says reluctant, because Igor, in many ways, you consider yourself forced into... I am not a dissident by my nature. I am kind of loyal servant. Right. You were forced into the situation, in your view. Um, so let's let's move forward here, Ilya. Um, could you, uh, before we move forward completely into the American scene, did you experience some anti-Semitism while you were a kid in the Soviet Union? My last name is not Jewish. My father's not Jewish, so I have the best of both worlds, so to speak, because the Jews consider me a Jew and the Russians consider me a Russian. Uh, it's much worse the other way around, it, it, in the Soviet Union at least, where you're <laughs> uh, a Jew, a, 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 a person that uh, 
has a Jewish last name. Uh, so I didn't get much anti-Semitism. I didn't even really know I was Jewish until I was around seven um, because Jews in the Soviet Union were so secularized. <laughs> Um, and it was in Siberia, um, where sort of away from the traditional hotspots of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, um, I, uh, I was pretty much ignorant of that fact until, and um, I've heard it said that if you forget that you're a Jew or you don't know you're a Jew, either an anti-Semite or a Chabad rabbi will remind you. And that's exactly what happened to me, both of them. Uh, around seven, some old babushka in the yard uh, started yelling at me and saying, you know, I had a Jewish uh, morda, a Jewish snout, and, uh, which I actually don't. Uh, oh, you don't. And, uh, um, because my brother got in a fight with her grandson. So after all that anti-Semitism, I came to up up to my parents' apartment and asked them, what is a Jew? And that they were really flustered. They didn't really know how to answer me. They went down there and yelled at all the babushkas. But um, basically, that's how I found out. And then when I was nine and the Soviet Union fell, Chabad came into to Siberia and set up shop, and they started educating us a little bit about what it meant to be a Jew, uh, what the Jewish holidays were. We got a, a Tanakh, uh, which I read with my grandmother, and that was sort of the both the education in anti-Semitism and in Judaism that I got simply because uh, by the end of the Soviet Union, really, the Judaism has been, had been beaten out of the Jews. Right, right. Igor, your experience with any uh, Jew hatred, anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union? Uh, my experiences are much more complicated. But exactly, I would like to use the little time I have to kind of emphasize a very important side of our discussion. Of course, anti-Semitism is horrible. It is horrible everywhere. But in Russia, where it is really top, it is not the main problem. It's only one of the clearest manifestation of the general problem of hatred of everything that is normal. That is, you see, uh, the example of uh, anti-Jewish hatred is the same as anti-American hatred, as uh, anti-intellectual hatred, as, well, anything anti, it, it includes everyone. Marxism is actually the same as anti-Semitism because, according to Marx, there is a special class of bourgeois exploitators who has to be eliminated. If Hitler said that, no, not the capitalists by the Jews, because Jews are the capitalists, it's just, that, you know, variations on the same topic. Thank you very much, uh, Igor. Uh, gentlemen, with the time we have left, just in terms of the evolution of Russia after 1991, uh, you know, instead of evolving into a democracy, Unfortunately, a mafiosa KGB man like Putin has taken over with his ruthlessness. Ilya, what do you make of that? Um, I think, unfortunately, we've learned both in the Middle East and in other regions in the, of the world like Russia that you can't export democracy. America tried that uh, in the 1990s. It brought in a lot of you know, American PhDs and MBAs to try to set up capitalism there. Mm -hmm. um, it won't work until the culture of a nation, the culture of a country changes. Right. Um, you can't just do it superficially. And it was attempted superficially and uh, ultimately, you know, what was below the surface welled up in the mid 90s. And Igor, you on uh, Vladimir Putin. I don't like to discuss him. It's too humiliating. It is a typical mafioso of the worst kind. But he has support. Actually, the whole country is behind him, as the whole Germany was behind Hitler. 
uh, the Cambodian henchmen were behind Pol Pot, were people who killed 70 million Chinese intellectuals during Cultural Revolution, were behind Mao. It's unfortunately the Russian people. And I don't see anything that can happen quickly. Of course, we have to push from here. For years and decades, or maybe a century, it wouldn't move. But if we push enough, I hope it will move after all. Thank you so much, Igor. Now, we apologize a little bit to our audience because the emphasis was supposed to be on the Sovietization of America. Such a fascinating background here today. We spent a lot of time on the fascinating background of these two individuals, but we will give some profound insights right now. And so, Ilya, we'll start with you. That Soviet virus that you came in touch with as a child and got to escape, it's coming here now through the left, through Obama, through Hillary, through the Democrats. What do you make of this Sovietization? Speaking of the left and American Jews um, and this virus, I recently read an interview with a Boston area uh, rabbi who said that, you know, um, Jews in Boston have historically been more wealthy than others, um, have had a disproportionate privilege. And I think in order for social justice, we Jews are going to have to lose some of that privilege. Well, this is the exact same um, sort of attack on the bourgeoisie that uh, the Soviet Union started with, you know, saying they need to redistribute a little bit of wealth and ended with a gulag. Um, as for the left, I'm seeing it the worst, the worst Sovietization in education, in our education system. And it isn't just in the um, in the colleges, it's going down into high school too. When I first came to America and I went to high school here, um, we, you know, it was very varied. Yeah, well, I had a professor who was a hippie, uh, sorry, a teacher who was a hippie and who assigned us, you know, chapters from Howard Zinn, but he never pushed it on us. And it was just a sort of genteel, old style American left. What I'm seeing now among teachers, among professors, and among democratic activists is the old, angry, uh, Bolshevik left, the really, really aggressive, um, we cannot see the, the other side at all, there cannot be any discussion between us or, and even the Mensheviks, um, and we're seeing some of that internal civil war in the left right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, really it's creeping in through um, the education system from the colleges on down now to elementary school. Absolutely. And, and I must say that uh, when I put it on CNN, when I put it on MSNBC, when I listen to Rachel Maddow, or when I listen to Hillary or Obama, I don't know, I just, I can't help from thinking that Lenin and Stalin are talking. Uh, Igor? Unfortunately, you see, the problem is not in the virus coming from the Soviet Union. It's endemic to America. It is much worse and therefore much dangerous. It comes from the biologically or statistically conditioned fact that a minority of people are born like that. They cannot work in a normal society. They want a revolution. They want a change because they cannot function as normal people do. But they believe that they when Ilya mentioned the Jews who have a privilege, the Jews are wealthy, not because, because they have some privileges. Are they what? Robbers? Did they steal what they own? No. They have more wealth because they're better, and it's quite normal. We should not distribute wealth. There should be disproportions. There should be inequality. Fraternité, liberté, and égalité is the most murderous slogan I have ever heard in my life. How can there be equality between me and a crazy guy in the street? 
We are not equal. I will never accept that. How he can be my brother? I don't want him as a brother, and he will never accept me. Thank you, Igor. And I think that Obama and Hillary would obviously have a heart attack at what you're saying, but their belief system, as we know, leads to, uh, leads to terror. Absolutely. And it was confirmed by historical experience Time after time after time. How yeah. many times you have to see that to understand that it cannot be otherwise? I don't thank, know. Thank you, Igor. Absolutely. Um, those of us with experience and those of us who know about the leftist and Marxist virus, we know that you cannot have a classless society without its terrorist component. And as Igor just, you said over and over again, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Khmer Rouge, Castro's Cuba, Sandinistas, North Korea, etc., etc. Now, my friends, before we go, the leftists are up in arms about how evil Trump is and what a terrible person Trump is. Even the conservative never Trumpers against Trump. But we know, don't we, that in my opinion, Trump is the best defensive weapon against the Sovietization of America. And Trump is doing a great job, and we need Donald Trump to stop this virus. Ilya, are you in the same league with me on that? Uh, I agree. He's a figurehead of a wider phenomenon in America, which makes it different from the Soviet Union, is the spirit of freedom within the American people. And that spirit is also viral. It's also infectious. It definitely infected me. Um, and it infects a lot of immigrants who come here with the idea of assimilating and of joining this wonderful country, this wonderful experiment. So in that sense, I'm optimistic because of Trump's election, because of this uh, backlash against political correctness, against social justice, which is really just socialism. Um, there's no justice in it. Um, and uh, as far as what can be done about it, um, about this left-wing um, Sovietization of America, um, yeah, I think number one, it's important to continue to support President Trump and um, vote against these people. That's the only way right right now. Uh, I mean, we're in a great position to change the face of the judiciary. And that's going to be a bulwark for the next 25 years. They're not going to be able to change America short of a violent revolution, which we can't rule out. Yeah. Um, but we need to continue electing these kinds of politicians uh, to office nationally and locally. And we need to continue to be involved in electoral politics, because as we saw um, in this past election, as soon as we start snoozing, uh, the left will catch up with us. Ilya, are there some friends or family or community members who have disowned you because of your admiration for Trump? Uh, locally, no. I do not have very far left uh, friends, family. Um, my father actually switched his allegiance from the Democrat Party um, because of the real almost racial animus that the Democrats have developed for the Russian people as a people. You know, it's always Russian this and Russian that. And I write a lot of articles and, you know, they look at my name and they write racist stuff under these articles about yeah. uh, me being a Russian spy and so on. Uh, so, yeah. And Ilya, how interesting that the leftists are so concerned about Russia when throughout the whole Cold War, we know who they were cheering for. Igor Milchuk, you have gone from reluctant Soviet dissident, I think, to a very, very passionate Trump supporter. Am I correct? Yes. I would only, you see, I'm a formal scientist, so I like all details. I support not Trump as such, but the bunch of ideas he's defending with such fury. 
Sometimes I don't like his behavior or the way he expresses himself, but it is absolutely irrelevant. If you have a brilliant plumber who comes to repair your sewers, you don't care how he behaves and what he says. He has to do his job. And Trump is now the best possible choice for doing the job. So I would be ready to support him in all ways. And you see, I was really in a bad position because I would like to donate some money. I started sending some money. And then uh, my check was returned to me. I didn't know that foreigners, well, I cannot give 5,000, I give $50. I believe that $50, $100 once, three months, it's allowed. No, unfortunately, I cannot (laughs) support him financially. Obama would have taken it. Of course, but exactly somebody to whom I was the official person in his campaign, uh, warned me that it's uh, illegal and I should not do that. Right. I swear I didn't know and I stopped doing that right away. Fantastic. So I'm ready to support him with my tongue, the only thing that I still have. Fantastic. Final words of wisdom, 30 seconds each. Ilya? Um, I'll go back to a, a question you asked before about um, you know the influence of Russian dissident writers. Um, I really like the practical writings. It's almost a dissidency manual and a manual to kind of fight this Kafkaesque um, uh, system that the left would try to bring in America. And that's Vladimir Bukovsky, um, his book, To Build a Castle. Um, It talks about fighting the leftist ideas and also the leftist sort of infrastructure using their own their own values their own morals their own little hang-ups against them i would recommend that book to everyone who would be interested in sort of seeing where uh the left-wing dystopia can take uh a country and what dissidents can do to fight back against that left-wing ideology absolutely and david horowitz is also a master of that former leftist um, and uh, David Horowitz's teachings on how to fight the left here in America, especially. Igor Milchuk, final words of wisdom? Uh, You know, Jamie, I believe that what you are doing is not only the best way to do that, but probably the only real way. We have to try to open eyes. And as far as I know, you are one of the very rare people who just have a regular offensive, not attacks, but non-stop assault on all those bad ideas. Right. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, Annie, please put uh, Igor's check in the mail immediately. Okay. uh, Igor, continue. I was saying, Jamie, that I would support you for you to spread the influence you are already spreading. It's really important. Thank you. That I think is the only way we have to preach. Jesus Christ changed civilization by preaching. And my name is Jesus, my first name. So you see, I am a born preacher. So help me and I will preach. (laughs) Thank you so much. And this was my favorite part of the program whenever the Glazov gang is promoted. Ilya and Igor, what a privilege, what an honor, what a pleasure to have you on the program. It's our privilege and our honor to be invited. Thank you very much. We need another couple hours, and uh, it's very interesting that Igor ends the program speaking about Jesus Christ, but we'll discuss that significance the next time, right? Okay. If I'm still alive, I would like to be on this earth when I'm talking, not from upstairs. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for joining the Glass Off gang this evening. We'll see you soon. Good night.